Hi everyone, it's Dr. Keenan, and I'm so happy to be here today with Robert Fernet from Miramichi, New Brunswick. Hello, Robert, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm great, thanks, Dr. Keenan, thanks for asking. So it's wonderful to be here with you. So if you can just tell the audience a little bit about who you are and the work that you do. Great, uh, I'm from Miramichi, New Brunswick. Uh, I am a family therapist uh, here in Miramichi. And uh, so I've been extremely busy. Uh, I work, uh, about 50% of my work is couples therapy, but the other 50% is really broad from just basic psychoanalysis to grief uh, counseling. Um, it, it's addiction recovery. Uh, I, I love family dynamics work. So I really enjoy working with family members to help them uh, examine kind of their mental health issues from the stance of attachment theory and family dynamic theory, because I think it's one of the most uh, misunderstood pieces that, you know, how, how our family is constructed is often has a big impact. For example, I always kind of joke with my clients here coming from an Irish Catholic family that I really understood, you know, understood a lack of boundaries and family enmeshment. While there's great love in the Irish, uh, in the Irish community, is oftentimes there's a lack of you know, understanding uh, our mental health in terms of space and, and boundaries with our family members. And sometimes that means codependence and all those fun things that I have a really great time with my, uh, with my clients, helping them figure out all those dynamics without making anybody the bad guy. So it's, qu it's quite fun. And so during this time, you know, over this past you know, year, how has this affected your work? Uh, it's in fact it affected it tremendously in that people are recognizing that they have to reach out. Uh, what I really like is people are recognizing they don't have to be mentally ill to have a clinician. They just have to maybe feel stuck or recognizing that maybe they're managing too many things, that maybe they need a safe space to talk things out aloud. I always say that I'm not an advice giver, but uh, I'd like to hold space with people where it's safe to say things out loud. And oftentimes when people are asked the right questions, and they feel safe, they find a lot of their own wisdom. So I get a lot of referrals. I'm, um, I'm, I'm trying not to burn out uh, So because I've had several burnouts in my career. So I work very hard at self-care. So I always remind clients every day that I do, never give homework that I don't do myself on a regular basis because we really have to walk it. Uh, we can't just talk it because at one time in my career, I talked it. And I, uh, I, I make the analogy, I was like the carpenter without his own front steps. So anything I give to clients to work on, I'm working on just as hard. So there's a lot of referrals coming in that sadly, I'm having to say no to, uh, because I'm, uh, I'm, at my, I'm at my limit. And, uh, and I wanna stay fresh and excited to see my clients. And uh, I know that I just have to have a limit on how many clients I'm seeing. So thankfully in Miramichi, we have a lot of great clinicians that uh, I can refer to. Well, it's great, Robert. Like, you know, you're referencing having boundaries, having self-care, holding space for people. But what really got me is that you don't have to be mentally ill because I think a lot of people think mm. that they need a diagnosis or some kind of label before they go. And okay. uh, like I, I sh share with my audience, you know, that I've been in therapy since, well, 2006 on and off. Um, mm. It's just been really wonderful for me uh, to be able to reach out and know that there's support somewhere. Yeah, I think it, I, and to know that you're not burdening someone, that it's someone that can be impartial, that it's completely confidential. And what I often laugh at is a lot of times clients are coming with a lot of Google diagnoses. And I actually, as a clinician, I'm taking away the diagnosis and actually often finding that they're quite resilient uh, and actually are doing very well given how many things they've been managing. Uh, another big piece of my work is uh, clients with trauma histories and PTSD. I find are reaching out more often, especially with COVID, because it's kind of alienating or isolating. So uh, I find that though a lot of those clients are reaching out and just making sure that they're continuing to process historical traumas so that new things emerging are not uh, impacting them negatively. So it's, uh, it's exciting work. Yeah, and I think, you know, when you bring up PTSD that we're having previous PTSD, but I think, don't you, that, you know, the, um, the aftermath of what we're going through right now, we're going to be seeing this for years, if not maybe generational from what's going on. Definitely. There's going to be impacts because people who are raised in this time 
our, our behaviors are different. People are connecting differently. People don't naturally gravitate toward each other. Think of when you meet someone on the street, we automatically have like a magnetic force pulling us toward each other's wall rather than toward each other, right? And, uh, and working with people with clinical OCD, uh, you know, I'm very, very particular, uh, struggled with some OCD as a young man, and I'm very perfectionistic. And my husband laughs all the time that I've been preparing for COVID all my life. Uh, so for some of us, uh, it's become really quite normal. It's normalized some, some of our uh, kind of uh, unhealthy behavior, but we've become the norm, those of us who are clean freaks. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it, there's definitely long lasting impacts. And uh, some of the pieces that when you had asked me to do this, you know, just thinking about a couple of core things, uh, I really thought about some of the core stuff that I've talked to clients about, uh, you know, if you wanted to summarize it or distill it into a few things is there's kind of a few key things that have kept me well during this time. Sure. Yeah. Give us your top three or however many you've got for us. Yeah. So uh, as you know, in our previous talks, I'm not always uh, the most modernist and have a little bit of a hard time of distilling things down. But um, just kind of lying down last night reading, I was thinking about a couple of the key things that uh, I think are really important that I tell people is um, about three days into the pandemic when we really didn't know what would be going on and we didn't know how we'd be able to help others uh, as a helper that's not in the medical system, but in the mental health system, um, is I was watching something by Dr. Tara Brock and uh, watching some Buddhist videos on YouTube and um, what came to me is Dr. Ter Brock was talking how it wasn't actually COVID that was so hard to reconcile ourselves with, but the lack of acceptance of it. And Deepak Chopra was talking about, you know, if we're at the first stages of COVID, but we too strongly desire to be at the end stages, we are going to be uncomfortable. We are going to be experiencing that resistance. And it really made me think for days that if I actually accepted COVID, I, would be, I could be peaceful. And I found peace in accepting what is. So I've spent a lot of time in this year just deepening my journey into mindfulness practice and recognizing that it's often my resistance of wanting something different than what is that is actually causing my suffering, not the thing itself. So that's been extremely powerful working with clients on acceptance and non-resistance work. Yeah, that's a big one. It's, it's gigantic and when, it's kind of mind bending. And, um, you know, I've had to do it a couple of times. I always spend my birthday in Cuba. Uh, I, I jokingly say drinking too much rum leaning up against a palm tree. And my husband would probably say I'm not exaggerating. Uh, and uh, uh, this is my second year, you know, that I've celebrated it in Canada and, uh, what I've chosen to do on my birthday, rather than complain about it, is I never repress. So I say my disappointment, send messages to my Cuban friends, and then make a list of things I'm grateful for to be alive and turning another age in Canada. And, and so that kind of connects with the, and maybe we'll move a little bit back and forth, but the acceptance work to me, um, as soon as I accept things, I notice I'm more easily to, able to move into gratitude. And gratitude is one of the biggest pieces. And, and even uh, Dr. Keenan, in different groups that I've worked with you on, my journey has been interesting with, with gratitude because for a long time I struggled with the term gratitude because I saw a lot of people repressing their real pain and having false gratitude. But now I admire them for just pushing past the ego to say, no matter what, I'm going to find things I'm grateful for. And I'm finding the more I'm reading and the more I'm meditating, gratitude heals. Gratitude magnetizes us toward that which is feeding us, that which is abundant. Our ego loves for us not to see the abundance before us. So I always say to people, I don't want you to repress that which is bothering you, but always, always move toward the gratitude. So I find that during COVID, rather than focusing on what I can't have, I have great gratitude for what I do have. And also I make sure that I dream a lot about the days when our restrictions will change, when our vaccinations will be widespread, when they won't only be for the privileged or certain age or for certain demographics, but for all. And that when I can get on a plane again, that plane will fly higher than it ever flew 
when I'm able to get back on after that long, after this long period of time. Yeah, gratitude is one of the most powerful things I know that I've done. And the more that I'm grateful and happy in this past year, I've done mm -hmm. it more than ever before. And it's really mm -hmm. helped me get through this time. And like yeah. you said, it's not the repression, but we always have the choice, right? And I, and that we can choose to feel negative or we can choose to feel hurt and pain, but we yes. need to be present with it. So accept it, going back to number one, not yes. it, so allow what is, is. Yes. And then say, my next choice is that I'm going to be thankful and, yes. we, and have the imaginings of the higher, higher, what life could be, you know, and, yes. and, and will be, and, and, and will, will be. And will be. Uh, one of my other pieces that I've been working on for about seven years now uh, is the radical compassion work. Uh, the Buddhist theory that Dr. Tara Brock elaborates on a lot. And a lot of people probably laugh at how cliche I am about Dr. Tara Brock, but she saved my life seven years ago when I read Radical Acceptance and lost over 130 pounds and have kept it off. And uh, I, I just can't explain how uh, people of the first 30 pounds when I lost it were like, how did you lose 30 pounds? And I said, I, it was 30 pounds of tears because I cried so much reading uh, Radical uh, Acceptance. And, uh, you know, just deeper and deeper into that journey of recognizing that. I said to a woman the other day, uh, because I work a lot with domestic violence, and I said, you're living in domestic violence still, but you're your own abuser. A lot of us are living in domestic violence with us, with ourselves. And with Radical Compassion, we push deeper and deeper and deeper into unconditional positive regard, into unconditional self-compassion. Because many of us, especially the women I work with, have very deep empathy and compassion for others, but are often not at all compassionate, ironically, with themselves. So what I find is by making room to know that it's very uncomfortable that we can't go places, that we're disconnected from family members in Quebec or Ontario, that we don't have the free freedom like we once did, or that we're just scared of what could come, you know, every time we just get okay, there seems to be new numbers someplace or like what you're experiencing is we have to make sure that in those moods and in those feelings, we don't just kind of in a toxic positivity way say, oh, I'm gonna be positive. Sometimes those push in and they're meant to be felt and that's where Dr. Tara Brock's RAIN work has really helped me. And uh, when I say RAIN, just I say to people, Google it, YouTube it, watch her videos on recognizing uncomfortable feelings, allowing, investigating, and nurturing. And I can't tell you, by being a friend to myself during this and knowing that I have safe and intimacy, safety and intimacy with myself, it has really gotten me through COVID. Robert, it is always so much pleasure to talk with you. And when I hear, you know, the work of Tara Brock and the uh, compassion and that self-compassion, because that's been very powerful in my life when I started learning it. And that lo loving yeah. kindness to be able to be helpful toward mm -hmm. ourselves. Yeah. So um, I think we'll definitely have to have another session. Maybe we'll ha have a talk about rain, because I think oh, it's I would a, love that. a really useful tool for people to be able to use. So, oh, I would love that because I think just a little bit longer talk about how we walk through it. And I'm reading her, uh, her latest book, Radical Acceptance, uh, Radical Compassion, Radical Acceptance, the first one. So this is the applied how to. So I've been doing it a lot. I woke up at four o'clock in the morning after a really difficult dream and did rain work at four o'clock in the morning uh, before going back to sleep. And I slept like a baby for the next three hours. We can do it in minutes. It's just a way of hugging and loving ourselves. I love that. <laughs> oh, well, Robert, I know that everyone's going to really get a lot from our conversation together. So what I've heard today is that, you know, being at peace with what is um, gratitude and how gratitude heals and it magnetizes us and the act of radical compassion that we can all have starting with ourselves. Absolutely. It must start with ourselves. It must. We must learn how to have the greatest love affair and it is with us. And I'm having it at 49 years old. I keep saying to people, it doesn't matter that I've gone bald and that my knees tell the weather. I'm in love with me. And by loving me, I love the world. I love everyone. And that's wonderful to have. Well, love is the strongest and greatest emotion above all. Yeah. It's all that's real. 
So Robert, if people want to follow you, I know you're really busy, but if they want to connect, what's the best way for them to reach out? Um, so people, uh, so I have my, I have my, uh, my work line and there's a text and that right now I even have a message on that. I'm not accepting, uh, I'm not accepting new clients. Uh, I would actually like to start doing a little bit more kind of what I did during COVID is sharing more messages because a lot of people shared with me that they felt even though they couldn't get into me, uh, by following me on Facebook, uh, on, on Robert Charles Burnett. Uh, just follow me on Facebook. I'll accept your friend request. And I, I actually have plans because it's so medicinal for me too, that when my spirit uh, calls to me, I was doing videos in the first stages of COVID. And then I just suddenly stopped and, uh, and the pandemic didn't end. So I don't know why my videos did. And a lot of people asked me to do some more. So maybe this will be that gumption that I need to, uh, to get back on and do some more. Well, that's wonderful. Well, thanks. I know I'll be definitely following you, Robert. Thank no, you so thank much you. for your time, for joining us from Miramichi, New Brunswick. And I'm sure we'll be chatting again very soon. Thanks so much. And I always love all your videos. They're just filled with light. Thanks for sharing them. Bye for now. Bye.